Hello, check. Can everyone hear me? Good. All right. So uh, I'm going to talk about a project I've been working on called Codetainer. And it's a browser-based sandbox. And I'm going to put that in quotes, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, I built it using Docker. Uh, a little bit about me first. Um, so uh, I've spent my career as a software engineer in security, basically. Uh, so I started off as a kind of security analyst and moved more into software engineering. Uh, I worked at security companies primarily. Uh, Symantec was one, and uh, Mandiant, which was kind of a high-end incident response company, doing R&D there. Uh, and I'm also an entrepreneur, so I co-founded a company called ThreadStack, which is actually based here in Boston. Uh, we're over in, uh, uh, by the seaport, actually. Um, so I actually left ThreadStack recently, and now I'm working as an EIR at a venture firm called Accomplice. And I just realized I tell people what that is, and like, people don't know what EIR means. Uh, basically, it's an entrepreneur in residence, and I just tell people I don't really have a real job, because my job is to kind of look at, look at interesting stuff that's going on in terms of new startups and what they're doing, new technologies and how that's changing, um, you know, how existing companies do things, and if there's any opportunity in the market to build something interesting. Um, in addition to all that, I organize the Boston Building Meetup Group, we meet in Kendall Square every month, and we usually have you know, interesting talks about Go. Uh, we're going to be doing some more kind of hands-on, like introduction to Go classes. So if you're in or near Kendall Square, I recommend that you come by there. And I think that's it. All right, so what is Codetainer? So uh, as I mentioned, like part of my quote-unquote job is to look at interesting technologies. And one of the things I've been interested in as an engineer um, and also from a market perspective, is Docker. And obviously, uh, you know, you heard in the last talk, Docker's being used for the various use cases. One of the really interesting use cases is the microservices use case, the ability to kind of package up all your code, all your dependencies um, in this kind of tightly knit unit that's easy to deploy. Um, it can displace a lot of like configuration management activities. So that's one interesting use case. But the other interesting use case that I've been looking at is, well, a container in some respects is also uh, kind of like an isolated boundary. It's like a kind of miniature virtualized system. Uh, most of you have probably used real VMs before, uh, and containers are a little bit different. Um, so I, one of the use cases I was looking at was the whole sort of like try X in your browser, where X can be, uh, for example, learning a new tool or learning a programming language. A lot of these are implemented using, uh, you know, kind of like a virtual version or like an emulated version of a programming language or some kind of custom sandbox. Um, so here are a couple of examples here. Like there's a, a kind of a try git where, which runs you through a git tutorial. Um, the one on the right is a little program that allows you to try uh, a, a tool called Bro, which is used in network intrusion detection. Uh, so I was wondering, like, is there a way to build something that's more generic that can be reusable and composable for multiple use cases? And my inspiration for this was this project called Code Picnic. It's actually a company. Um, so if you haven't looked at this, it's actually really cool. Um, you basically can log in. It's a hosted SaaS service. And basically, you get this kind of browser-based Docker widget that you can put in your browser and use it to do things like uh, demonstrate APIs, uh, let the user play around with some code. Um, so it, it's pretty cool. But I was looking at it, and there were some problems that I had you know, from a security perspective. Uh, for, for the most part, the containers are running as root in the, in the, uh, on the really code picnic systems. And that allowed you to basically install any tool you wanted on these uh, containers. And the other problem is, like, well, if I can install any tool and this has network access, I could probably use it to abuse other systems, and Code Picnic would be responsible. So I could install like, you know, a DDoS tool and you know, spam someone else. So if I wanted to run something like this on my website, I wouldn't want the ability for uh, a, a user to do that. I want to be able to isolate what the user could do. Maybe like if I'm demonstrating a tool or a programming language, I don't need the container to have network access outbound. Um, I don't need it to run as root. Um, and Docker actually has the capability to uh, implement some of these restrictions. 
So just talking through some of the more, some more of the use cases, um, we talked about most of these. I thought another interesting use case would, when you think about training people, uh, there's a lot of tutorials on how to code. Um, there's less tutorials on, well, how do I use this sort of uh, Unix tool to maybe debug something, or you know, I want to learn reverse engineering. Like, there's no real tutorials on doing that that you can interact with. And I'm the kind of person that likes to, uh, I, well, I can read something, but I just totally forget it. So I actually need to interact with it to be able to learn things. So I thought uh, a, a widget or a tool like this would be useful in implementing some of these kind of debugging uh, training and other different use cases. Um, and another use case that isn't really covered in the code picnic use case is the remote management. Like there's a browser, you can have a browser connection into a, inside your container basically. So that might be interesting for some people. So the requirements for this project, uh, I want it to be flex flexible and powerful enough to support these multiple use cases. I want it to be programmable, API driven. Uh, I want to be able to host it myself so I can actually uh, do the third thing, which is to be able to secure uh, the whole Docker and host, Docker host instance around it. So I can turn off networking, I can apply like an app armor and SE Linux profile to limit what the container can actually do um, and generally have control over it. So I built this as an open source project. So let's talk a little bit more about the technology that makes it possible. How many people here know what Docker is? Pretty much everyone. How many people have used it in some capacity? About half of you, it's pretty good. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, Docker is a kind of virtualization, right? So the way I like to think about it when I explain to people, most people know what VMs are. It's virtualizing the whole system. But the way Docker works is basically virtualizing a process. So a container is really a process that runs, and it has its own virtual file system. So it thinks you know, some certain path is actually its root file system. Um, and it takes advantage of something in Linux called namespaces, which allow you to segment off what each process can look at. So one of these things, for example, is networking, right? Maybe you don't want this container to see the same network uh, activities that the, another container can see. Uh, the other, other things would be certain system calls. Um, you, you, there's a whole slew of things that uh, the Linux kernel supports uh, in terms of namespacing. So more, a little bit about, uh, is this not working? Um, well, I'll just talk through it for now and, until I can fix it. So uh, another advantage of, of Docker versus uh, like your typical like VM sort of uh, virtualization is that it's very lightweight. So when, you, when you're shipping around a VM, you create an image, that thing could be several gigs. Um, it's gonna take several minutes to actually boot up an operating system on it. And it's not good for use cases where you want something to spin up fast and maybe die really quickly. So in terms of processes, processes start up really fast, usually in seconds or less. And you know, the file system changes, just because of the way Docker was built, can be measured in terms of kilobytes um, or megabytes instead of like these huge gigabytes. And the same thing with the memory footprint, right? It's just however much memory that process is using is what the container is gonna use. Uh, images are kind of layered and reusable. So another cool thing about Docker um, is because it, it's shipping its whole file system as basically this huge tar gzipped set of layers. Um, so you could basically build uh, your custom application image on top of a, you know, an existing image. So uh, if you guys have used Docker, you've probably heard of Docker Hub. But Docker Hub is a registry for people to do exactly that. So what people can do is actually um, you know, inherit from an image someone else has built. So someone else has built, let's say, an Ubuntu 14.04 base image. You can just inherit from that in your Docker file and actually uh, uh, work from that and, and build your application on top of that. You don't have to, you can take advantage of that other person's work building that operating system image. Um, and the other cool thing about Docker is that there's powerful introspection and management APIs. So I can really script the creation, the destruction of containers, the pulling of information outside of it, looking inside a container, which is harder to do with uh, you know, traditional virtualization. All right, cool, it's working in. Um, so just a little bit more about introspection, you know, here's the API, uh, it's published on Docker Hub and it's actually pretty comprehensive. 
So, Cotainer is a system, you know, as described before, it's like Code Picnic. It's basically a browser widget that allows you to connect to a container and run certain actions. You can kind of program that widget, uh, you know, for certain use cases, like, you know, doing a tutorial or teaching someone how to code uh, in, in a way where you don't have to, like, kind of emulate the REPL of the programming language. You can just use the actual language and limit what the container can do using Docker's, uh, you know, security properties. So the way this works is there's, a, there's an API server. That's basically the core of it. And it just sits in front of the Docker API. And it's spinning up these container processes, which are really just container processes uh, that you can apply certain profiles to that limit what the process can do. Um, the API server has various routes that allow you to do things like spin up containers, uh, register an image in Docker for use in the container, uh, and you know, stop them, et cetera. And so just some of the components. Whoops. A container is just a Docker container. I think I covered all these. The image is really just a Docker image that's registered for use uh, in a container. And a profile is a you know, profile whose language sort of matches the Docker API configuration for its security. Other tools I use to build this include Go. So I just have ended up doing a lot of programming in Go recently because uh, it's pretty, uh, I don't know, I feel like it gives the right balance between flexibility and speed of development. I like that it's statically typed. I like how uniform the code is written, how uniform the code looks when it's written. Like you look at one Go project, they all look the same. It's just really addictive to write in. And also the Docker APIs are written in this, so it would be easier to take advantage of them using the same programming language, et cetera. Xterm.js, which allows me to render terminal characters in the browser and SQLite, which I use for storing just basic metadata about the container, like you know, what containers are running, you know, what images are registered for use in container, uh, what the profiles are, et cetera. So just to give you a little kind of feel for how it works, you start the container server, server which is the web service I described before, and there's also uh, you know, some command line actions you can do, I'll show you later. First step is creating an image, and you can do that with the API here. Um, it's just, you just do a post to, I don't know why I have animations on there, but I did. Um, but basically you just do a post to slash API v1 slash image, and uh, you're just basically registering a Docker image that you have on that machine for use with Codetainer. So you can see here I'm registering a TCP dump demo image that I made with Docker. Step two, to launch a container is really simple. You just basically post to API v1 container, and you want to supply the image ID and an optional profile. Um, there's an, an, an optional name as well. That's just kind of used for tracking within the database. Really simple. Step three is interacting with it. So there's uh, a few APIs that are around interacting with it. The one that you would probably use, you know, in your browser would be the view API, which basically renders an HTML terminal view. Uh, it, fully, it resizes automatically, so the way you could use this is the same way you'd use it in Code Picnic, just basically slap it in the iframe. Um, unlike Code Picnic, there's actual APIs that to you know interact with it a little bit more granularly. Um, you know, you can actually attach the WebSocket that allows you to send and receive data from the Codetainer terminal, uh, and you know, send is kind of just a wrapper on top of that that allows you to send individual keystrokes. Um, so more, so there's uh, APIs to actually interact with the files inside of a co uh, container. So you can list files from a particular path, uh, download a file, or upload a file. So this would be really useful if you're building like a code editor example. Maybe, you know, in your, in your application you have your own code editor, syntax highlighting, validation, you have a run button. You just basically copy the file over the container, run it within the uh, REPL there, or however you want to run it, and then get the results back. So I mentioned there's a command line thing too, and basically it just wraps some of the uh, APIs so you can use them on the command line. So you can list running containers here and then register an image. Some of the challenges with building this were dealing with things like, you know, missing APIs in the Docker API. So the Docker API is pretty uh, thorough. Um, but there were some things that were missing, like I couldn't list a file uh, from a particular path in the file system. I could actually pull files off of it if I knew where they were or upload files to it, but I couldn't 
really listening. So I really wanted a way to do that. Um, and I also wanted a way to be able to minimi minimize risk of abuse by sandboxing what a container can do. Um, as I mentioned before, Docker has these knobs that allow you to kind of mess with uh, the security and isolation properties of a container. So this is actually straight from the Docker API documentation. Um, so you can see things here. You can specify the number of CPUs you want it to use, memory, uh, what ports you want to expose, if you want networking on or off. There's a whole bunch of different things. Uh, that are very useful when you're trying to sandbox what a container can do. Uh, so I basically took advantage of this, and I created a, a spec, which I call a, a profile. And uh, you know, it's basically just a JSON file that has a similar format to the Docker API JSON that allows you to specify specific things you want triggered for a container. Or container. So the way you use it is you just register it uh, with a name. So what I'll do, it'll just slurp off that JSON, and then you can sp pass its ID as a container profile ID when you actually create the container. So um, going back to sort of the missing API problem, the way I thought I could solve this was basically Docker, obviously, can, you can execute anything you want inside a container using their uh, exec APIs. So I was like, well, why don't I, for each container that I start up, just mount a directory at a certain reliable location that has the tools I want to use. So for the file listing thing, I just created a small little tool in Go that listed files from a given path. It returned some JSON, and then I just built an API around that, uh, and bam, I could do that for every container that I was running. And this is just kind of how it works. Um, there's that create exec thing. I don't like showing a lot of code, but there's code there. Okay, so I'm gonna pray to the demo gods because I'm gonna try to do a live demo. Uh, we'll see how well this works. So I'm gonna demo two things. Uh, one, just like just basic, like how do you create a container? Like those three steps that I described before. And the other one is like a little app I built that kind of is a tutorial around LSOF. Uh, so let's see here. Um, so we're gonna basically, the first step is we're gonna build this Docker file. So if you look here, um, this is a Docker file that has HTOP installed. So I'm gonna build a container that's, whose whole purpose is to demonstrate HTOP. So <laughs> uh, I'm gonna do that and it ran really fast because I clearly built this before on the machine. Usually it would download different pieces of the file system, but there we go. I've uh, basically, if you look at the command line, what I've done is I've, I've used the docker build command to build uh, my container, or my container image really, and I tagged it with a name of htop. Uh, so what I'm gonna do here then is register this for use with the container thing. So I'm gonna use that register command, image register uh, htop latest. So it registered an image, great. So now I can actually use this to actually launch containers within my API server. So now I'm gonna actually spin up a container and hopefully this will work. So I'm gonna use the create command on the command line. Again, this just kind of is a easy way to do it rather than using the curl or using the HTTP APIs. And I'm gonna specify the name of the image I wanna use and then the name. And it looks like it succeeded. So let's see what it looks like. Just kind of this, this is the, uh, in the browser, that's my other demo. Whoops, I don't think it copied correctly. Let me just exit this. If you can get a, <laughs> hold on. See, I knew this would never. Copy and pasting from Tmux is not an easy thing. I, it barely works, there we go. All right, so you can see it created my container and it's just a browser widget and I, there's htop and you can run it there. Yay. Um, you know, the cool thing about this widget is like you can resize it to whatever, you know, whatever it auto resizes, which is one of, one of the most annoying parts about building this because I'm really bad at HTML and CSS. Uh, so there's that. So just to see what a more full use case, I, I started putting together this tutorial which, uh, you know, 
isn't that great because again, my HTML, CSS skills are not awesome. But you know, it's a it's meant to be an LSOF tutorial, right? So you can see the I have this Node.js app. What it does is it makes a, a call to my um, Container API server, and if there's no you know Container uh, ID in the session, it creates a new one for this browser. So if I opened up a new one in like an incognito window, it would create a new one for this new session. So you can see here it's 074, this one's A6A. It's got a different host name because it's a different container. So each session gets their own sort of sandbox to play around in. Um, and you know, so some of the cool things you can do, like this is, again, there's like two things in this tutorial, but one thing is like teaching them like what the LSOS-I command does. And even though this stuff is running in an iframe, right, normally I wouldn't be able to, you know, interact with it, but uh, because there's an API behind it and I've proxied that through my server, I can basically send it commands. So you can actually confirm the output of this. You can type it yourself if you want to, but if someone gets stuck, they can, you know, uh, they can just run that command. You can have clear steps. Uh, one other thing I wanted to show but didn't have time was like the whole file save use case. Like you could have a file editor in this window, uh, uh, ship it off with the kind of file save API, and then run it in the container and show the output there. So back to the slides. Um, so the status of this project, it's a little bit alpha. It needs some more stuff to make it production ready, like auth, I think, would be important. <laughs> Documentation, uh, testing. Um, oh, oh, one of the other things I didn't, I didn't demo in the LSO, if I actually used a profile with that to limit. Usually in a, a, a Docker container, you can't run LSOF, but I was able to create a custom AppArmor profile that gave my, this particular container permissions to run it. So um, you, the profile thing is really powerful to allow you to tweak what the container can do. Um, so that's the GitHub URL. It's all open source right now. Um, so if you want to contribute, let me know. I am going to start putting more issues, like there's a bunch of stuff there already I need to you know, kind of finish up and start working on. Um, or you can just ping me, that's my email and my Twitter handle. And yeah, if you have any ideas for it, I'm more than welcome to hear them and welcome collaboration. Uh, so on the back end, what were you running the Docker containers in? What do you mean what I was running it in? I was running them with Docker or... Oh, okay. I mean, yes, but uh, you just use a um, regular Linux system, no other... Oh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I, I use Vagrant on my machine. I do okay. all my dev in there. Awesome. So, yeah, it's just regular... I mean, Docker has its own requirements. Like, you need a basically a modern kernel. Um, and this project in particular, I'm using the mo latest version of Docker because I want, like, all the APIs. They release pretty... Um, they release new APIs pretty frequently. So I don't know if it'll work with like 1.7. So you need 1.8. 1 1.8. Okay. Yeah, 1.8 is a kind of modern version to use this. Hi, it's a great presentation. It's, my mind's a little bit blown right now. But oh. um, <laughs> <laughs> the, um, you mentioned there were some missing APIs in Go. Uh, sorry, not in Go, but in, in Docker. And right. I was wondering, have you talked to the Docker team about it? or I they... like started looking at it and then creating a pull request and I was like, uh, I can't be screwed. Like it's way easier just for me to mount a volume with the tools I want. Um, I'm assuming like if you look at the Docker issues, there's literally like hundreds, maybe thousands of open ones and they're really, I mean people, they're really responsive. They're not just sitting there. Mm -hmm. But I, I haven't dug through to see if someone already had, uh, you know, that, that request to open or not. Um, like I said, like with each release, they, they add like a, a bunch more APIs. So. Uh, I expect the whole file listing thing will be added sooner or than later. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, this is a Docker question. I've used Docker in, in, in previous companies, and I'm not sure if this is still a limit, but it at least used to be that if you ran multiple Docker containers on a system, you had to specify sort of a hard-coded memory amount that they would take. And I noticed in your configuration it had memory swappiness. So if I've got a couple Docker containers and one of them is being, you know, quiet and the other one's busy, do yeah. they still, is it still hard-coded, they each get the memory they get? I don't know if it's hard-coded. Um, it's, yeah, I, I would guess I'd have to see how they implement it using C groups. Like, I don't know if that just reserves it automatically or what. Uh, I know that this parameter here, there's memory and then there's memory swap that you can also configure. It's a different parameter. 
Uh, yeah, I honestly do not know specifically that. Okay. okay. No? I baffled you all. <laughs> all right, cool. Yeah, if you're interested in Go or Docker, come grab me. Like, again, like, come to one of our meetups. Uh, it's pretty fun. Um, yeah, and if you want a, a job working in Go or Docker, I'm working on some interesting stuff that will come out soon. So probably shouldn't recruit from the constant contact people, but if there are any visitors here. <laughs> Question. So what are you working on next? Uh, Especially in this area? How we say stealth. <laughs> it's stealth right now. <laughs> yeah, if you like early stage company, like, yeah, just come talk to me. You know, if you want to work with cutting edge tools and things, I have opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.